Welcome and thank you for joining us. You're listening to the Beyond 50 radio program. I'm Daniel Davis. As many people have listened over the years to our business talks, you try to glean and find ways that you can conduct and build a business in a way that seems prosperous, but at the same time gives back to the community. On the program today, we're going to be joined by someone who is widely considered to be one of the pioneers of the check cashing industry in the state of California. He is the founder of the Financial Service Centers of America and Community Financial Service Providers. He also spearheaded much of California's legislation aimed at regulating check cashiers and protecting consumers. We're going to be talking about his book, Nixland, Wild Ride in the Inner City Check Cashing Industry. And I'd like to welcome to the Beyond 50 Radio program our guest, Mr. Tom Nix. Tom, how are you? I'm great. Good morning, Daniel. How are you? Doing well. I really got a kick out of when I started reading the book to realize that you more or less grew up in the same areas that I did, San Pedro, California, and we're talking about Harbor Hospital, and I was thinking, wow, this is really close to home here. Wow, but of you... course, yours was back in the 1950s, where mine was in the early 1960s. So. All right. Well, I'll, I'll give you that one, but uh, you grew up in San Pedro? Uh, yeah, San Pedro, born in Torrance, Wilmington, Long Beach, you name it. Wow. <laughs> so when oh, I was right. hearing you talk about all these areas, and especially when you were talking about your childhood moving into a new neighborhood and the kids kind of sizing and measuring you up, deciding which one's going to beat your butt first, I remember all that. <laughs> it's a pretty That's crazy great. city that back in those days. Tell us about that and how this all started for you. Well, you know, I... Uh, as I in San Pedro, uh, when, when I went to San Pedro High School, I uh, joined a club called the Essex. And, uh, you know, most people would call that a gang today. Mm-hmm. But in those days, we had maybe 25, 30 uh, clubs in town. Uh, our, we had a bunch of great guys in this club. Our objective was to, uh, we had three objectives, to um, get drunk, get lucky with the girls, and fight anyone that looked at us in a hostile manner (laughs) so we were pretty successful at that Um, I had dozens and dozens of street fights in those days I was good at it I liked it and um, that's really one of the the uh, amazing things is from from that time growing up I mean I also went to USC and got a business degree there and had a a number of great experiences but I think that one of the turning points of my life was in 1976 when a friend of mine urged me to read uh, the book Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. Mm-hmm. And uh, I developed actually a crusade for about 10 years of understanding how I and learning everything I could about how to you know, create a more happy, healthy, prosperous life for myself and actually have written just a three-page paper called the life's key concept concepts and it's on my website if anybody's interested in taking a look at it now you started this all off too with the check cashing but originally it started out selling bread and you just thought you'd kind of add that service as something as a side note to help people out but it kind of turned into its own thing yes my my dad was a sales manager of, of a company called golden crust bakery and their major competitor was helms bakery and back in the 50s and 60s, you know, people had their bread and their milk delivered to the home. Well, by the by, the um, mid 60s, that was going away as housewives all went to work. And my dad uh, had uh, Golden Crust sold out to Helms. My dad started a bakery distributorship in uh, on Firestone near Alameda Street, basically in South Central Los Angeles, near the Watts area of Los Angeles initially uh, to distribute bakery products and sell Dale bakery products that the drivers didn't uh, sell that day. And that evolved into a full-service mom-and-pop grocery store where we learned how to cash checks, and that evolved into Nick's Check Cashing. Mm -hmm. Now, what was interesting is, first of all, the idea of cashing checks and sometimes how risky that can be. But generally, as you were talking about in your book, especially in these neighborhoods that seem a little oppressed, that for lack of a better word, that people were very hardworking and, you know, pretty well honest and, and, and you know, took care of business. Exactly. Um, you know, there's a common misconception uh, that people that live in the low-income areas are, you know, somehow uh, not trustworthy and, 
and don't work hard, and that is completely false. I mean, 90-something percent, I mean, a huge percentage of the population that lives in these communities are good, honest, hardworking people. And there is a small segment of the population there that, that are criminals, and they do prey on the people that live there and the businesses that, that, do, uh, that operate there. So you have to protect yourself from that element. But as long as you can do that, we had a fabulous uh, relationship with uh, with our customer base, and and uh, you know we had the business for 42 years before we sold it to uh, Connect to Federal Credit Union, which is the old Hughes Aircraft Credit Union. Now, tell us first of all how you begin to build this business, uh, cashing checks. I mean, first it seems straightforward, you know, this for that, but eventually, you know, more and more people are growing, and it got to a point where you actually had a standalone building you talked about, for instance, that was an auto repair shop, and you kind of made a deal that the guy finally scratched his head and said, you know, how can I pass something like that up? Right. Well, we were cashing checks in the market. We had had a little two-window booth in the back of the store, and it was so absolutely popular that we had lines that would go down. It was actually up, up a few stairs. It would go down the stairs and all the way down the center aisle of the store and out onto the street for people coming to cash checks there. And we give great service, and, and um, you know, we sold bread, 17 cents a loaf in those days, So we were, which was even cheap back in the 60s. But in, in 1978, to answer your question, we opened our first freestanding drive-through check cashing facility on the uh, corner of uh, Imperial and Figueroa. And within one year's time, we were cashing a million dollars a week in checks. Wow. It was unbelievable. So we sold the market in '79 and, and began building the chain of uh, Nick's check cashing stores. Mm-hmm. Now, you know, when you take a look at the landscape today of these check payday loan places versus what you were doing then, what were the differences? Well, the, the the check cashing industry and the payday loan industry are two different industries. Mm-hmm. The check cashing industry is basically the same as it it's, as it's always been, with the addition of some additional products and services like uh, prepaid cell phone cards and uh, prepaid debit and master cards and that sort of thing, which were not around in the early days. But the check cashing industry really takes the place of a bank for people that are unbanked that do not have a bank account. And, and it's, a, it's a cash and carry concept where people come in, they present their payroll or government check. Uh, you, you cash the check, you charge them a fee, they pay their bills with money orders. In our case, we charged about 2% of the face value of the check and gave the customer up to five free money orders to pay their bills with, which is actually very competitive with the bank, you know, with the bank charges. Mm-hmm. Uh, for people that you know have a, a low or moderate income, um, the payday loan industry, on the other hand, provides uh, service to people that are banked. So people that go to a check cashing place that do not have a bank account cannot get a payday loan. Payday loans are a relatively new product, started in the 90s, and um, the way that works is somebody comes in with their their personal check. They post-date the check for uh, in California up to 30 days. They pay a, a a fee for the for the provider to hold the check and deposit it on a pre-arranged date. And so it's a completely different business than the check cashing business. Mm-hmm. We did both services in our check cashing facilities. To, you know, uh, at, after that became legal, and but it was a small part of our business. It was about 20% of our revenue. Because most of our customers could not qualify for, uh, you know, for a payday loan, they didn't have a bank mm-hmm. account. Mm-hmm. Now, was what you were doing uh, potentially uh, good for people actually going to the next level where they can start banking, or were some of these people pretty locked into having to use the service? Well, the that's a great question. Our our, our mission had, had has always been to create. Um, a one-stop shop where people could transition from check cashing into banking. Mm -hmm. And we were successful in uh, teaming up with Union Bank of California in uh, 2000, and 36 of our stores, uh, people could come in and open a a Union Bank checking account or savings account 
and but they had to use the uh, full service ATM that was on the side of the building to conduct their everyday business. Um, one of the one of the motivations for us to sell to connect to Federal Credit Union is they were able to uh, put in full service banking, so the the people could actually come in and vote with their feet. They could choose alternative financial service products offered by NICS or go to the Connecta windows and have full service banking. So we're really proud that we were able to do that. Um, one of the dynamics of the business is that if you're um, if you're if you get a small amount of income, so your checks are relatively small, check cashing is is uh, very inexpensive. Mm-hmm. But it's it, it's based on a rate. Of, two percent of your check so as your check amount goes up so does your cost to do business with the uh, check cashier Mm -hmm. on the other hand banks charge you more because you don't have very much money Mm -hmm. in terms of minimum balance fees and if you bounce a check 35 bucks a whack so uh, on the other hand when your income goes goes up they charge you less so if you put those two businesses together in the same place you give the uh, consumer the opportunity to, you know, choose whichever service best fits their needs. You know, it's pretty interesting, too, to consider that you were in this business. And, you know, a lot of times it was uh, pretty risky. For instance, you were talking about people who were getting welfare checks that there were, you know, two times a month they got these. And so people started scoping when you would go and get the cash because, Generally, those days landed on a Saturday. (laughs) So you found yourself in kind of hot water sometimes. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, in in the book, Nick's Land, I I elaborate on a a number of pretty amazing things. Uh, One of them, as you point out, is some TV-style armed robberies that we had over the years. (laughs) (laughs) We had, uh, you know, I have a whole chapter in the book on the 1992 riot, which Mm -hmm. was just an incredible experience and it could be a movie actually i um had an assassination threat by the chicago mob i worked uh, 10 years as an la county reserve deputy sheriff so i share a bunch of the stories of my experience doing that and i worked in south central los angeles so the um you know i think that the book is you know not only a, a, a small business success story but uh, it's pretty exciting from the standpoint there are experiences there because of the the criminal element in the community that you know most businesses don't have to face. And then the other thing I'm proud of, Daniel, is that you know I share a lot of lessons learned in this book. And so um, you know that was one of my objectives of writing the book. Mm-hmm. I know it was uh, it <clears throat> takes a lot of thinking to realize that somebody really wants to be a deputy sheriff when it pays a dollar a year and eight dollars a month in expert shooting fees and trying to wrap your head around that one there uh, what were yeah. you thinking so you you actually did read the book <laughs> yeah, well yes <laughs> great thank you hey well you know i was a young guy and uh, we were in a rough neighborhood and i didn't even know about the program but the local sheriffs came, came and inspired me to join it and it was a 26 week uh academy two days a week so we got the same training as a regular sheriff and when i was done with it i i worked in a black and white patrol car one shift a week uh for 10 ye- for 10 years and i loved it but uh you know it's irrational mm-hmm. to to risk your life for a dollar a year <laughs> but i did get that 8 dollars a month uh expert shooting pay so that was pretty exciting that's funny. Now, tell us, what were some of the things, I know one of the key uh, components you talked about uh, for successful business was service, and you hear a lot of people tout that this day and age, especially in the banking industry, and you're thinking, you know, what are you people thinking here? You, Oh, you know, customers are our number one priority, but yet at the same time you're screwing everybody out of their money. You know, it just doesn't even make sense, but service was something that was very important to you. Yes, and, and service is probably the the hardest thing for any organization to stay on top of. Mm -hmm. And the reason that is, is because it doesn't demand your attention. Everything in business demands your attention. You got to get the bank deposits in, you got to hire and fire people, you got insurance, you got to pay the rent and all the bills and, you know, you got a lawsuit over here. Everything demands your attention except 
customer service. So to maintain excellent customer service day in and day out, you've got to figure out a way to keep the organization's eye on that baby. You've got to make sure that's really important. Otherwise, these other things outweigh the customer service aspect. So you've got to have the fire in the belly in terms of taking care of the customer, and not, not only with an intention, but also with your policies and procedures. So often a well-meaning you know, well, policy gets in the way of the organization um, actually delivering excellent customer service. I made it my business to be a teller, go out and work the teller line um, once a month or once every every two months just to see if, if the policies we're making were, uh, you know, we're getting in the way of our ability to, to you know, mm-hmm. deliver that excellent customer service. It, it is difficult. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it's never easy to please everybody in the first place. Somebody always wants more than what they have in front of them, you know, and or, you know, they just, they can be having an off day and they take it out on you. And it's it's pretty crazy when it comes to starting a business. It's definitely as I've suggested and heard from many experts over the years, that if you really want to learn a lot about yourself, start a small business. Exactly. (laughs) What did you learn about yourself? Well, before we go on that, I I want to share uh, one thing uh, regarding the last question. Mm -hmm. Our business philosophy was to go about business with a high level of integrity, a strong sense of fair play, compassion, and being an integral part of the communities we served. So we weighed each decision, including customer service decisions, by that basic business philosophy, which was a huge point of difference for us from you know a lot of our competitors. And the other, our strategy was to provide fast, friendly, courteous service at a fair and reasonable price from locations that were clean, <clears throat> well-maintained, and professionally staffed with people that lived right in the community. So those, you know, that philosophy and strategy, you know, positioned us to be able to uh, give great service. Now, what was the real question? I forgot. Well, now the question came back to, you know, that when you start a small business, you learn quite a bit about yourself, who you are. And what did you learn about yourself as you were building a small business? Well, I, le- I learned, number one, that um, if you're going to be successful in any business, you've got to find a need and fill it. Mm-hmm. And you can have the best idea in the world, but you know if you're not filling important needs, you're not going to be very successful. Also, that especially as a small businessman, you've got to have a lot of passion for what you're doing, and because it's it's um, it's scary. You mm-hmm. put everything you have uh, on the line financially, and your reputation, especially if you borrow money from friends and relatives, and, and or have them invest in in your operation, you're on the hook not only for everything you own, but, you know, your reputation's at stake. So you have to uh, have the attitude that you know, you're going to give it your best. You're never going to quit. you got to be courageous about it. Uh, those things, um, you know, it was surprising how unnerving it was to uh, be in business because, you know, things scared you. Mm-hmm. Well, especially if a pickup truck comes crashing through your place to uh, do a robbery that way, which <laughs> is in the book, and I thought, you know, somebody must have watched the original Terminator movie or something. <laughs> uh, was that an amazing story? Would you like me to give it? I, 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 was, I, I was just amazed that somebody actually did that, but it wasn't surprising what people will do when it comes to getting money. But, yes, please. Well, this is, this, it was right at closing in North Long Beach, uh, a Dodge Ram truck comes crashing through the front lobby window and through the cement bulletproof barrier into the working area of the of the branch. The manager runs into the office. They throw as much money as possible into the safe and flicks the dial, which, you know, once the dial has been flicked, you can't get back in it. Mm-hmm. But there was still quite a bit of money left laying around there, and the the robbers grabbed the money, you know, threatened our people there, didn't hurt them, l- luckily, but they jumped out into a waiting van uh, outside, took off at a high rate of speed, with the with the sliding van door open. Well, luckily there was a Long Beach police car coming by just at the time as they took off, and he went in pursuit. They crashed, went into uh, crashed into a liquor store. They all fled. Cops caught one guy, 
in a plant nursery. Then they got a call of a suspicious person by a neighbor nearby, a suspicious person in their backyard. When they got there, they found one of the guys um, dead. He had tried to climb the fence, fell, broke his neck. There was the gun and the sack of money with money laid around the yard. Unbelievable. And, And the third guy got away. So we got all our money back, but that 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 stuff like comes right out of TV. <laughs> exactly. And sometimes you can't even write this stuff. <laughs> right. It just kind of helps itself. Now I know that you were in your community for you know forty years or better, and that you mostly hired people into your business that were from the community. And to me, that seems like a pretty smart move because that stretches the hand of how people take. Um, ownership of their community so that maybe if there is the bad element that happens, well, there's a lot more control over being able to do something about it, it seems like. Well, yes, and, it, and it's also the right, fair, honest, honorable thing to do. I mean, you're, you're, you're doing business in a certain community. You owe that community, uh, the, the, the people that live in that community, the opportunity to get those uh, jobs and the, and the careers that are created there. I mean, I just think it's the right thing to do. It's also a good smart business move because in the customer service business you, if you come in and you see your friends and neighbors working there you know that that makes you feel like home mm-hmm. so it's it's a very smart thing and, and in the minority community it's it's very important to folks that that uh, the businesses that operate there you know provide job opportunities to the people who live there mm-hmm. so we measured up there and you certainly tried bringing big bank financing into investments in the community to help the community build and begin to thrive as well. Yeah, well, we had uh, we had equity partnerships with uh, Western Union, Sun America, Union Bank, and then finally sold to uh, Connect to Federal Credit Union. So we we uh, we did all we could to uh, you know cr- create a a, a business that really filled important needs in the right way. When we sold the company, and we had um, we had 60 branches, 450 employees, and we served 400,000 in-person, over-the-counter transactions per month. So we were an institution oh. in South Central. You know, when you consider those are the areas that most people have a view of, whether it's through news or television, that generally the only thing they stores and things like that, and and they talk about, you know, that they just don't get a chance to thrive or to, you know, build on anything. And, and, you know, your story is just the opposite of what's actually going on in there. And, you know, you kind of wonder who's feeding the news, for instance. You know, how much of that is really true, that it's really that bad, or is it, you know, versus the stories like yours that never really get heard or, you know, very rarely get heard anyway. Well, I think there's a bias in the news. I mean, they're looking for... You know, things uh, that will be newsworthy, say they don't print the good news. Mm -hmm. Uh, For example, for, uh, for, you know, close to 40 years, we we provided an annual food drive, which we distributed $100,000 worth of food and uh, coupons, um, uh, money orders or gift certificates from the local grocery store, stores that would uh, provide a free turkey, we had 1,200 people, 1,200 families that, that participated in this program every year. Never once was mentioned. Well, maybe maybe once, but we got very little publicity right. for that because uh, it wasn't popular. And it certainly wasn't popular for uh, a news outfit to give any good credit to a check cashing company for mm-hmm. anything they did. Well, and, and you take a look at this story and why it's important and why we love bringing the stories out is because sometimes in a world where it seems there's so much chaos and it makes a person feel that everything is out of their control and whatever they decide to do to make a difference doesn't really seem to matter. It's like, no, this is going on and there are a lot of people making a difference and it does matter. Just get up and do something about it, you know, and it, it just... That's what kind of bothers me of the fact that you had so much going on, and as you said, it was very rarely ever really reported, you know, to make people feel like, you know, that there is a difference that can be made. You just have to, you know, take the first step and do it. I agree. Mm -hmm. It's very, very important. And what's also important for our listeners to know about this as well is that you guys were more or less the first that created or coined the term mini-mart. 
<laughs> yes, we are. <laughs> took that right from Arco, or they took it from you, right? <laughs> That's correct. <laughs> Tom, can you give us a website people can find out more about how to get the book? It's a great story, definitely inspiring. <laughs> well, thank you. I, I think people really like the book. People tell me that read it that it's a fantastic book. It's uh, nixland.net, so it's N-I-X-L-A-N-D, and it's in November, I-X-L-A-N-D.net. Mm-hmm. And I've got a really good website, and I really would like people, I, I noticed on your website you have a personal development section. Mm-hmm. I'd love to have your listeners uh, look at my paper uh, that's, uh, you know, life's key concepts on there. I think they'll get something really valuable from that. It's a three-pager, so it's really easy to read. And I know that you're also on YouTube as well, where there's a couple of videos that you want to suggest that people watch as well. Yes, we have uh, in, in on the website there's a session called memorabilia and uh, I have a number of, of videos there one which is amazing is uh, news news footage from the, the from the riot and there's a whole bunch of stuff there that, that people will find interesting but if they decide to buy the book in which I hope they do they can get it at amazon.com or barnesandnoble.com or it's on as an ebook you know Kindle etc and you can Go through the net, the, um, the website and go right to the book on Amazon, what have you. Well, very good, Tom. Thank you so much for joining us here on the program. It's nice to know that the stories are out there. You just find them, and then you tell everybody, and get up and make a difference. And that's what's important. Well, thank you very much. It's been very enjoyable, and I appreciate your interview style. Very nice. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank Again, you. the book is Nick's Land, My Wild Ride in the Inner City Check Cashing Industry. Find out more about how you can learn about some of the things that you should when it comes to starting a small business and what it takes to be successful in your community. We also want to thank you, the listeners out there, for tuning in. You've been listening to the Beyond 50 radio program. Our website is beyond50radio.com, the number 50. Thank you again for joining us, and remember, live your day past halfway.